Our guest today earned his undergraduate degree in political science and served as student body president at the University of Illinois. He earned, he earned his law degree from Northern Illinois University in 1978. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the City Club of Chicago, Alderman Bob Fioretti. Alderman. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Jay and Ed and the Board of Governors of the City Club of Chicago for inviting me back to speak here. It is almost hard to believe that this is my fourth year in the City Council, and I appreciate the opportunity to give an update on the victories achieved and the experiences that have shaped my priorities and goals. This in itself has given me a unique perspective on the challenges and opportunities I see for our great city. And wherever I go in the ward, and throughout the city, I hear the same three issues of concern from our residents. They want to know what we, as civic leaders, are doing to create jobs, reduce violence, and improve public education. And in the second ward, we continually address these issues, which go hand in hand in creating economic opportunities for our communities and our residents. I ask myself, what should our investment priorities be? Using our limited resources, how do we use them to their highest and best use to stabilize and grow our local economy? How do we work towards prosperity for all of our citizens? We've seen successes in the second ward, and I know they can be a model for all 50 wards of this great city. In a report sponsored by the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, it was stated, everything that the Chicago region and its leaders do in the coming decades must be judged on how it contributes to economic vitality. Economic planning and investment, both public and private, is subject to many conflicting demands, but a focus on one overriding goal will make it possible for Chicago to keep its priorities right. By creating employment opportunities and working to preserve jobs, we help people stay in their homes, which is paramount to keeping our neighborhoods from eroding. I am honored to be hosting another annual job fair Friday at Malcolm X College on West Jackson with more than 50 employers. We are bringing a Pete's fresh produce market to Madison and Western and a new target in the 1100 block of West Jackson creating jobs in neighborhoods that need them most. And plans are in the works to bring a Costco to 14th and Ashland, all in all creating over 700 permanent jobs and putting vacant properties back on a public tax roll. Public safety is also an economic concern. Businesses are reluctant to go into areas of high crime and families work hard to leave blocks where gangs, drugs, and violent crime goes unchecked. Since becoming an alderman, I've gained an even greater respect for the men and women of the Chicago Police Department. I've seen our youngest and most vulnerable citizens being prey to the dangers of drugs and violence in our neighborhood communities, and it is unacceptable to me. I'm in regular communication with the six district commanders in the second ward, and it is clear we have to put more police officers on our streets, and there is no higher priority at this particular time in our history. At the April 13th City Council, I introduced a resolution with 19 of my colleagues as co-sponsors, calling for hearings with the, with the police superintendent and the city budget director on how vacancies within the police department are going to be filled. Currently, there is almost 1,000 vacancies for officers in the department. To date, no hearing has been held because of our administration's unwillingness to confront the city's present weaknesses and deal with them head on. But yet, we are still moving forward. There's a construction of a new police station at, at Racine and Blue Island to begin, that began in July, and shortly we will have the much needed much needed facility for the 12th district 
And if you've ever been to the outdated and outgrown station at Racine and Monroe, then you'll know how dire that need is. We've used TIF funds to upgrade street lighting in both residential and commercial areas. We've not only added to the aesthetic value and brightened the sidewalks and alleys at, at night, but along with other measures, better lighting serves as a crime deterrent. Education is also another key economic issue. We don't want families moving out of, the, out of Chicago because the public education system has become substandard and that they cannot afford private schooling. The education issues are not just perceptions, but real issues that require real change. We continue to fo focus on quality public education options, and my office has been working with neighborhood schools to promote access to local residents. I wish I could say that we are turning the corner on economic prosperity since the last time I stood at this podium but we are facing a national unemployment rate that has been above 9% for 16 consecutive months, and in Chicago, it stands at 10.5%. Businesses nationally are holding in reserve $2 trillion, which is approximately 25% more than at the start of the recession. That's money that is not being used for business growth, investment, or hiring. That is money that is not currently, but can positively affect everyone in this room. Our personal savings rate has risen from zero to 6%, but we all, as business leaders and individuals, are saving because of doubt and uncertainty. We need to work together to create solutions such as tax credits for employers who bring manufacturing jobs to Chicago and tax credits for infrastructure improvements. And of course, tax credits for non-Chicago-based companies who move to Chicago and create jobs. Tax credits equal job growth. We've seen this work extremely well in the film industry, making Chicago a leader in film production due to generous film tax credits. If only the generous income from the films was enough to make a difference. This year, we in Chicago face a $654.7 million budget deficit. I understand our city faces extreme pressures to balance our budget in a time when we cannot raise taxes on our citizens and neighbors. And let's face it, they are already struggling. Nearly 80% of the city budget is personnel, and most of that goes to police and fire. We cannot, and I refuse, to cut vital city services. Neither of these are a viable option. Therefore, the question that we have to ask ourselves, how do we move this city forward? Turn Chicago back into the city of progress, back into the city of positive change, a city where no one is forgotten. The maxim, think globally, but act locally, has never held more weight than it does now. All of us are fighting several uphill battles simultaneously as we work to bring jobs and improve this city. We've just battled the longest national recession since World War II, but let's not sell ourselves short or forget that Chicago and its will is as strong as the steel that built our world-class skyline. And I never, never lose sight that Chicago is one of the world's great urban areas. We are proud of being named in 2008 U.S. City of the Year by the Fast Company magazine. And that was due in part by many of you here in this room. One thing we must always remember is that we cannot determine our accomplishments as a city based on our victories alone but it is our reaction to our failures, our shortcomings, and our goals yet to be met that gives us all character of a community. We have seen some great turnarounds from the Chicago Fire and all the way this year to the Chicago Blackhawks Stanley Cup Championship, and we are not stopping there. Chicago, with its entrepreneurial spirit, ethnic diversity, and work ethic, not giving up, and rising to the challenge is in our DNA. 
As a first generation American, I look at my own father who came from Italy and entered this country through Ellis Island, and my mother whose parents were from Poland, immigrants who came to this country, to this great city, with little more than the clothes on their back, but with a wealth of spirit and a belief and a determination that if they worked hard, that they would make a better life for themselves and their family. And I believe that these values, coupled with my experiences as second ward alderman in the last four years, have uniquely prepared me to lead us into the future. A future where business leaders are not vilified and labor leaders are given respect for the sweat their workers give day in and day out. I am the only alderman to travel all 50 wards and bring back ideas to my ward, and I did it in the last six months and throughout my term. I know that there is not one solution to solve our budget problems, but I do believe that there are a series of measures that we should take to put this city back on solid financial footing. And I believe working collaboratively together, we will find solutions. For example, when I was first running for Alderman, I discovered that at a construction site at the east end of the ward, a condominium high rise near the lakefront was being built, but they had construction workers who traveled three hours each way, each day, to the job site. And this is unacceptable. Why? Because there are people here in the city of Chicago that should have been working on that construction site. And since being elected to the city council, I have made hiring in, of community residents a top priority. And with the expansion of Rush Medical Campus on the west side, I worked to ensure that over 500 jobs would go to people in the community. They are living in Chicago, shopping in Chicago, paying taxes in Chicago. We are making progress to hire locally, but we still have a long way to go. I supported the use of TIF funds to leverage millions of dollars in additional private capital, which brought United Airlines to the Willis Tower, meaning 2,500 additional jobs in the city. TIF dollars have also leveraged private capital to retain and expand the Chicago Mercantile Exchange with more than 1,800 employees in Chicago and to hire over 900 more. These same TIF dollars are what some of you in this room have used to start your business, continue growth, and make it easier and safer for all of us to get to this luncheon today. According to Bloomberg Business Week, monthly revenues from a casino in Northwest Indiana, 30 minutes from downtown Chicago, totaled $50 million in tax revenues in July alone. And I believe it's a safe bet that a percentage of that revenue came from Illinois residents. Gaming has and continues to have its share of, of controversy. But folks, let's face it, we are losing significant amount of revenue right across the state line. I believe we should give serious consideration to a Chicago casino. What should we consider, the, and we should look at the social impact of a casino would have, but the opportunities it could present for employment, tax revenue, tourism, hospitality, and entertainment. Chicago has been named one of the top cities for green initiatives. And I wanna talk about an initiative that I was recently, uh, that I recently proposed and I was interviewed on WTTW in Chicago tonight, and I'm talking about the method of garbage collection. Currently, the, the city picks up trash by ward. A task anyone familiar with the 50 boundaries would recognize as unnecessarily complex. This method is both inefficient and expensive. Too many man hours and too much gas money is wasted as drivers are forced to tra traverse and the gerrymandered ward limits and drive from one end of the ward to another. Ironically enough, this will all yet change with the new census. I've proposed a new grid system of garbage collection that will save the city millions of dollars and ensure more efficient services. And simply put, let's take the waste out of garbage collection and fund recycling the way it is done in most modern cities. Last year I stood here and we have to find, and I asked and I fought for a way to find an increase in our tourism budget. 
I had to prevent, uh, I fought to fight to uh, further cuts that were being proposed in our tourism budget. This is an investment to attract people and, and their tourism dollars to this city. And according to the Chicago Office of Tourism, in 2008, the city drew 45 million domestic and international visitors who spent $11.8 billion generating $656 million in tax revenue for the city. According to the Chicago Convention and Tourism Bureau, Chicago ranks 14th in the nation in dollars spent marketing ourselves as a convention and tourism center. The New York tourism officials estimate that the city earns $7 for every dollar spent on tourism promotion. Clearly, investing in tourism should be viewed just as that, an investment, not an expense. We have a broad array of cultural resources to enhance the quality of life, and we need to invest more in those resources and promote them. The second ward is the home of the Field Museum, the Shedd Aquarium, the Adler Planetarium, world-class destinations visited by people from around the world. What more could and should we be doing to promote Chicago on the global uh, stage? My team members and I are working on a tourism tax credit initiative and we'll, we'll be rolling that out later as a broader agenda this fall. We have to work diligently to attract and maintain a quality workforce at all levels, and that begins with good educational opportunities. I've made education a real priority by giving the schools the time and attention that they deserve. In my first term, I worked with the Chicago Public Schools to open up five new schools in the ward and fought to keep open the Montefiore School, a tried and proven school for troubled and special needs students who are at most at risk. I've also implemented a new system to allow school administrators to communicate and share ideas with one another. We have to work diligently to maintain a quality workforce at all levels, and that begins by, by providing a wide range of high quality public educational options. I've made public education a priority in my ward and I've worked with the CPS staff and administrators with all 40 Chicago public schools that are in my ward. There is an ongoing and spirited debate about the quality of education being provided by CPS. The second ward represents the full range of problems and opportunities by the, that are faced by the Chicago public school system with students at some of the most high performing schools in the nation and students at some of the most challenged schools. We have some new principals who have impressed me with their spirit, their energy, their leadership and commitment to our students. Leadership by principals and teachers is a crucial factor to our schools and students alike. And I think we can all agree that there's still a lot more work to be done on the educational issues in Chicago, and when I have an opportunity to serve Chicago in a greater capacity, I know I can count on the leaders in this room who have not forgotten that it is the same quality of education that served as a catalyst for many of you to excel and be here today. We will work to ensure the same opportunity for our future leaders. In 2009, I budgeted city resources for our parks and dedicated several new parks in the ward, including the Battle of Fort Dearborn, Printer's Row Park, a field house at 18th in Indiana, and reconstruction work at Dunbar Park. And recently, we dedicated the new Adams and Sangamon Park this summer, a full city block in the West Loop, two blocks from Greektown, with walking areas, green space, a play lot, fountains, and a dog-friendly area. From movies in the park to, to clean and greens that I've implemented, these are typical of the quality of life benefits a neighborhood park can bring to a community. I think it's important that we particularly engage our young citizens to teach them civic pride, respect for our public spaces, and sustainability. These are a few of the reasons that the Friends of the Park presented me in 2009 with the Best Legislator Award. 
but I couldn't have done it without my staff and particularly with the help of Leslie Reck, who's here. Leslie, can you stand and give a wave again? Thank you. And I also see at the same table, and I would like to recognize Army Sergeant uh, and a Second Ward resident, Michael Lanham. Michael, thank you for your service and your family, especially, and your brother Brian. And recently, I, I have to say, Michael presented me with a flag that he wore uh, during his tours of duty in Iraq, and I'm, I hold that in, in esteem, and I, I carry that with me uh, all the time in the, in the car. I have it, and I thank you for what it means, and, and thank you for your commitment and your family's commitment of their service to this country. Our future depends on our ability to compete in a global economy. And it is incumbent upon all of us to come together and play a role in investing in the future of our city, to work together in supporting public education, our cultural institutions, and the arts, the amenities of this great city. These are challenging times. We've seen challenges before. I get up every day and look forward to new challenges before us, and I appreciate the accomplishments that we've been able to make. And I encourage all of you to be involved in your community as much as you can be. Support the causes that interest you. Volunteer and support youth mentoring programs. Make a difference. We need to have determination and the will, for it will take some time, but we will put this city on a solid financial footing, working together unifying people, and continuing on the path of being a first-class global city we know we can be for all of us and a city that we can be proud of. And for those of you that greeted me and encouraged me to enhance the role that I play in this city for serving you and our city, I thank you for your support, and I know I've worked very hard, and we've seen many successes for the residents of the Second Ward and the city. And I know in my heart that Chicago's best days lie ahead. And whatever the future holds, whatever challenges we face, and what uncertainties lie ahead, there are a few things I know for certain. And that is my work ethic, my desire to seek positive change for in the communities I represent, and our commitment to this great city. Thank you. Okay, those of you that have questions, if you just hold them up, we have staff around that will come and uh, pick them up. So if you just write down your question, I see several in the uh, back of the room for our staff to pick up. <clears throat> and while... Would you, would you like some water? Yeah, a little bit of water. Um, Jay, do you have some water over there? My president, Mr. Doherty, informs me that there are a couple of uh, omissions that um, he inadvertently made. So while Alderman Fioretti is gathering his um, breath and strength to answer our questions, let me introduce a few people. Uh, number one would be a um, superb public servant and excellent member of our county board, Bridget Gaynor. And on the other side of the room, since we had a number of um, aldermen here, probably enough to hold a city council committee meeting, uh, former alderman Dick Simpson, professor at the University of Illinois at Chicago. <laughs> and uh, point of personal privilege, uh, one of my former students is here who informed me today that he's a candidate for alderman of the 29th Ward on the west side, Tommy Simmons. Tommy? Okay, we're ready for a few questions. If you're elected mayor, <clears throat> when? did you announce today? <laughs> if you're elected mayor, how long will it take you to balance the city budget, and how would you do it? 
See, no easy questions here at the City Club. Well, on May 16th of next year, obviously, you know, I am giving ser serious consideration to uh, running for the office of mayor. And it's not an easy decision uh, to unite this city and all 50 wards and what we face. Uh, I believe that we can get through this year's budget. It's going to be a lot of tightening up of what we, we do. Uh, but it's the following year that it'll be difficult. And so no matter who becomes mayor on May 16th, in 45 days we have to make the end of the year report. We have to look at our comprehensive budget of what happened the year before. Uh, we have to have an economic team in place that knows how to deal with the problems that are going to face this city. An economic team that's, that's going to go out and reach out to everyone. The fallacy of this administration has been, and for the last two years, myself and other colleagues have, sit, have stated, we should start the budget process a lot earlier. We should start talking about the deficits we face in April and not wait till October when the presentation occurs and we have two weeks to discuss all the, uh, the problems. We need to do multi-planning for our budget. We, can't, uh, we, we should be looking at what is going to happen in the future. We clearly need an economic team that has the wherewithal, the ability to tackle the problems of the following year and the next year after that. This is going to be tough times, but I think with, with citizen input, and I believe citizens have answers that we can find will, will solve the budget deficit. Yes, I think we ought to be looking at our TIFs aggressively. We ought to be looking at our state aggressively, uh, and we ought to be looking at our federal government aggressively. And together we will solve the problems of that budget when, when I was going to say when somebody was mayor, um, but for the next mayor and as we go into the future. Thank you, Alderman. Thank you. Um, this is from Mike Folks. Mike, where are you? Okay, back there. Sounds like he must be a West Sider. He may even be a member, resident of the Second Ward. He really has three questions. They sort of relate to Madison and Western. What can be done to revitalize the West Side? What are the plans for developing Madison and Western? And how do you feel about, Miles, don't pay attention to this, Felony Frank's hot dogs? Uh, I think the re revitalization of Madison and Western in the corridor is going to start when we break ground in the next couple of weeks on Pete's Produce. We'll be bringing a restaurant there. Um, we're going to bring other amenities, other businesses there, and so it should start to uh, mushroom out at that point. Um, we also have uh, a streetscape beginning that finally, uh, that we've been working on for all, almost three years. Uh, that began on Western from Van Buren to Madison that will lively up and be uh, liven it up, be attractive for residents and citizens uh, a, a, a all accord that, that will come into the area as they go to the United Center and see the wonders of what we can do along this corridor here. Uh, we have several projects underway for additional housing uh, and we're continuing and we're moving those projects forward. Uh, the second one, the uh, well, that was the third Felony one, I hope. Franks. Felony Franks. Felony Franks is a good concept, uh, but a bad thing. You know, it, it, the owner is taking advantage of those that are ex-offenders. And let's face it, there's, there's a half a dozen restaurants in and around that area that are owned by ex-offenders. But to, to, to say uh, Felony Franks, the home of the Mr. Meaner Wiener, food so good it's criminal, well, you know what? I have an issue with it when, 20, uh, when across the street, Reuben Ivey was killed in that location. A young man from Crane who was turning his life around, and they want to they wanna market this and franchise this concept. Well, I hope they don't go beyond the Second War, but you know what? I, I, I offer them ideas to change the name, but the owner was so intent. You know, second chance. Give it something else. Give it a different name. Every, but, but I believe when I look at it that the owner's using the workers who are all ex-offenders to his benefit. Okay, thank you, Alderman. And uh, the, the reference to um, Miles Berman, of course, is um, his parents started the Superdog at Milwaukee and Devon back in the late 40s. And if you go there and use his name, you'll pay full price. <laughs> Um, 
one of the questions that we received is, if you become mayor, what would the f be the first three things that you would do once you took office? Well, I think we have little time uh, at that point um, because we're, we're midway through a year that's going to be very difficult next year, and we have to plan the following year. But again, putting an economic team in place, uh, how we're going to unite our communities, what we're going to do on the educational forefront. Uh, I, I have a lot of ideas that I'm going to uh, present during the course of uh, the, the next couple of weeks on education, um, how we work with our unions, our teachers, how we pull the spirit back together, because if we don't educate our children in the right way, then there's no future for this city. And we, we, we ask teachers to become, uh, when they walk into the room and teach uh, their students, we don't, we, they're not only teachers, but they're lawyers and doctors and therapists to deal with the issues of the children who don't have the wherewithal to deal with the, the problems at home, who have to get across gang lines to come to schools. I'm going to improve the police department to ensure that the safety of our, our kids are the top priority. Just this week, I've had several meetings with the police department uh, regarding some of our schools. And the issue here is to make sure our kids have good quality public education, good after school programs, and when they get home, that they have the right kind of benefit from parents who understand what it means to to raise their children and be proud of their children in this city. Okay, this relates to um, our police department. Um, if you were mayor, what would you do with Superintendent Weiss? Well, first of all, um, I would begin, I think the, it's incumbent upon the mayor to begin the search for the new uh, police superintendent today. We shouldn't waste time. We are. Uh, as I've, as I've been in the city council for the last three plus years, I noticed that we're always reactive. We do things in a reactive method. We never are proactive in trying to do what we need to do for this city. And one of the, one, I think it's clear that not only uh, the police department and the men and women of the department, but the people in the communities uh, believe that a search should start for a new superintendent today. We shouldn't wait until the contract is up. Uh, for a contract employee, and we should start searching uh, both in the department and nationwide, put together a great panel of people, of former superintendents, of deputy superintendents who know the wherewithal of, of the department, know what the department's about, with community input from citizens from all parts of this city to, to add to a search for a quality and, and one of the best superintendents that we can have to lead this department in the next few years. Would you insist that um, the new superintendent uh, come from the ranks and be a Chicagoan? Well, I, I do believe that there are enough quality people in the department that could serve as superintendent. I hope they throw their hat in the ring. They ask for, uh, for the job. They want to be on the job. Uh, but again, I think it's up to uh, that group as we begin the search and we re-engage national search companies and, and, and local search companies to look for the superintendent that has the, that has the, the will of the people, the will uh, of the, the people, not only the people in the communities, but of the police department, but as somebody that can be looked up to uh, for the service that they can give because being the police superintendent's not an easy job, it's a tough job, and, and I think we can find one in all likelihood in the ranks, but uh, you know, those final threes should be determined uh, and serious consideration should be given by the mayor and who's ever the mayor uh, to that position. And we need somebody to bring up the morale of this department that is so low right now, uh, that is at the lowest level it's ever probably have been. And uh, I think we will find somebody uh, probably locally. Thank you, Alderman. Um, shifting gears a little, um, maybe this is why Bridget and um, Sarah Burke uh, are here today. Uh, uh, Alderman Riley was here about a week ago in our auditions for Chicago Mayor series that uh, Jay is putting together. <laughs> Joe, we may put you on. <laughs> um, and uh, Alderman Riley suggested that perhaps the city is trying to do too much, particularly in the social service area and healthcare, 
and suggested that perhaps uh, the city health services be turned over uh, to the county. Um, Sarah, that was just to get your attention. I'm Northwestern. Um, but do you have any thoughts about moving certain services away from the government of the city of Chicago to the county or the state? Well, I don't know if that's the issue. I think the issue that we really have is we have too many governmental entities, and we have to start getting rid of the governmental entities. And we have to, we have to focus together uh, and bring entities, uh, I mean, if we cut them by a third, nobody would know that uh, they were gone. Um, and so when we look at what we're going to do in terms of bonding issues, maybe we work together with the county uh, and other uh, governmental entities that need bonds that we're doing similar projects to. That we look at as we eliminate uh, uh, overlapping jurisdictions and overlapping governmental entities, I think it's in the best interest that we pare down the size of government in the state of Illinois because it's just too big and too confusing for too many people. Okay, thank you. And uh, we have one last question, which in some ways uh, touches on all of the other questions that uh, you've answered. Um, this is, why would anyone want to be mayor? <laughs> Inheriting a city where many of your colleagues have been relieved of their jobs and not by the voters, where the, there are significant budget problems, high sales taxes and fees, a high crime rate, and an underperforming school system. Why? You know, that is a good question, and I don't know who asked that one. Um, Nikki, my better half, always asks the same thing uh, uh, every night, and, uh, but she, she supports me, and I support her and her endeavors. But I think uh, being mayor of this city is a, a unique opportunity for all of us, but it's what our vision will be for the future. And I have a vision for the future of this city, and I know how to implement that vision. And that's going to separate me from, if I, take, if I make the next step and decide to run for mayor, it will be the, a, a, the step that will make it all different for me and the other candidates as I approach this uh, uh, road towards February and towards April. It's going to be a tough undertaking. The, I, I traveled all 50 wards, from some, some of the wards from 10 miles to 100 miles. I went, I went through alleys, I went down main thoroughfares, I went down many of the streets. You know, I went to the greatest focus groups that one could ever have, and those were yard sales. Think about it. <laughs> when you talk to the people at their yard sales, and I heard the problems, I heard those three issues, and I heard them over and over and over again. You know, I, I joined Alderman Moore in his bike tour through his ward, and the same issues were present there. And, and, you know, as uh, I see Tom Tunney and we go up to Wrigley Field often, you know, but we hear what, what happens and the same three issues resonate. I went down to, uh, through the Roseland area and I got off at 115th one day, or 111th one day, went up to Michigan Ave and I, drew, I, I drove to the end of the city. I got out and I talked to people who are struggling, struggling, struggling. And if you look what happened in the last four months, something happened to this city in the last four months. There are more people now sleeping under Wacker Drive than ever before. There are more people sleeping in parks. And in April, when we had a clean and green, a block and a half from the mayor's house, we found 20 families that were living outside. If you don't think we are in pain in this city, Let's not kid ourselves. The unemployment rate is striking everyone. And when I was on the floor and I voted against the mayor's budget in 07, the first budget that I voted on, and I said this is gonna be another form of foreclosure, and I talked about the credit crisis that was happening and it was gonna last for the next three and a half years, and now it's ended, but where is the movement to allow us to stay in our homes? Where's the movement for, to allow people to have a good education, good job opportunities? It hasn't happened. I do have a vision for the city. I believe as I make the next steps, I'm gonna put that vision together for the people of all of this city, not just the, those that are in this room, and we will move forward 
We're going to make it a great city, a city we can be a proud of in both our educational opportunities for all of our kids. We're going to make it safe because I, th I think the overriding question you've got to ask yourself, do you feel safe walking down each and every street in this city? And if you're a property taxpayer and, you f and your answer is no, then we've got to find new leadership, new direction for the future of this city, and I intend to, to find a way with your help to implement it to make this a great city that we will all be proud of.